Oh, these WrestleMania podcasts every year. It's a gauntlet. It's hard. Ooh. Okay, John Cena versus The Undertaker. This match was very short, and it was perfect. And everyone who's complaining about it can suck my dick. So what I loved about this match is even though the match itself was very quick and very short, the storyline leading up to the match is very storied and has a lot of history behind it and I thought was very interesting and well told, profound even. And I'll explain why I think that because I don't think it's getting enough credit as a pro wrestling storyline. I mean, right now you've got so many people trying to explain to the world what's great about pro wrestling storylines and how pro wrestling can be really deep and interesting as a narrative. You've got a guy like Super Eye Patch Wolf made a big video about Kenny Omega and Kota Ibushi and that whole thing. A couple years ago, you had Max Landis doing this huge analysis of Triple H's long continuity-driven character arc. And that's what I loved about this match. Not just the match itself, although the match itself was perfect considering the storyline leading up to it, and the storyline leading up to it was great in itself as well. This was a story of two men, two legends, each confronting their own mortality, and one of them embraces it and accepts it, the other one runs from it, and lashes out against it. It's a simple story, but it's a good one. It's a very effective one. And the way this match ended up going down was the only way that it could have gone down and made sense. I loved it. So you've got The Undertaker, who for a million years had this undefeated streak at WrestleMania. He was the guy, the badass, unstoppable warlock wizard who no one can beat. He's got magic powers, he's got friends on the other side, he's the phenom, the dead man, the American badass. Eventually, the streak is ended by Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar kills him. He's devastated. We're devastated. Everyone's devastated. It feels like an era is over. He comes back the next year. He kills Bray Wyatt. He comes back the next year. He kills Shane McMahon. So he gets some more victories under his belt. But it's just not the same at that point. Without the streak, it almost seems like he's no longer this mythical figure. Without the streak, all you're left with is a mortal man. And you can't help but notice that he's getting slower, he's getting less agile, he looks like he's getting winded, his hair is getting gray, his knees don't work, he's just an old man, man. Finally, he fights Roman Reigns last year. And just as Brock Lesnar had defeated him, Roman Reigns now defeats him. So now he's lost twice at WrestleMania, and not only did he lose, the match he had with Roman Reigns was terrible because he was at his absolute worst Physically, he was very clearly old in that match. He looked and wrestled and moved like an old man. He couldn't even get Roman up for the tombstone at the end, and it was sad to watch and uncomfortable. It was a bad match, and Roman beats him, and after Roman beats him, he lays his gloves and his hat and his coat in the ring, and he retires. He retires... Not only having lost, but having lost in a bad match. Because he's old. And because The Undertaker is like this noble man, he recognizes that. He recognizes that his time is over. And he takes off his hat and coat, leaves it in the ring, and says, It's finally happened. I'm too old. Goodbye. The legendary, mythical Undertaker, who many had assumed was immortal, is now left broken, defeated, and forced to confront his own mortality. But he holds his head up high and accepts that mortality because he's the Undertaker. He respects the business, he respects wrestling, he respects us, and he respects himself. 
he has enough respect in him to acknowledge that his time is done and accept his loss, accept that he's past his prime, leave his shit in the ring and go out, holding his head high as gracefully as he possibly can. Now on the other hand, you have John Cena. John Cena who has become a legend in his own right. The guy who has been carrying WWE for 15 some years. He's been the man on top. He's beaten everybody. He's been unbeatable. He's been a superhero. But he's been going off to Hollywood and he's been doing movies. And you just can't keep up with all the new guys who are there when you're not there full time. The dude's been around for 15 years. John Cena now is starting to feel the gravity of time. And he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it one bit. John Cena keeps coming back and keeps fighting in matches, but now something is different. Now he keeps losing. He loses to Kevin Owens, he loses to Brock Lesnar, he loses to AJ Styles, he loses the Royal Rumble, he loses the Elimination Chamber. He's not the unbeatable Super Cena that he once was. He's not a young man in his prime anymore. He's 41. And he cuts a promo on Talking Smack where he says, Hey, I'm 41, and he sounds sad and dejected. He looks depressed about it. And as he keeps losing all of these matches and losing all these opportunities, losing at the Royal Rumble, losing at the Elimination Chamber, he starts realizing that he's losing his chance to be in a big marquee match at WrestleMania for the first time in forever. And he starts getting scared. He starts getting desperate. Because it's apparent to him that his time at the top is coming to an end. That he has to now step aside for the new generation of talent. He now has to confront his own mortality. But he doesn't want to confront it. He doesn't want to accept it. So he starts getting desperate. And in his desperation to have a big marquee main event WrestleMania match, he calls out The Undertaker, who had previously retired gracefully. So Cena starts calling out The Undertaker and saying, I don't care if you say you're retired. You're not too old. You're just afraid of me. You're a coward. So now you've got John Cena calling out The Undertaker every week, and The Undertaker is not responding. The Undertaker does not give a fuck. He's retired. Screw you. Leave me alone. I don't want to fucking wrestle you. I'm done wrestling. I am old. At least I can admit it. Leave me alone. But Cena can't accept that. Cena is desperate to remain relevant. So every week he calls out The Undertaker, and every week he gets meaner and harsher and more aggressive and starts crossing the line more and more with the personal insults and the mockery and the put-downs, trying to bait The Undertaker, trying to provoke a response, trying to anger him to get him to say yes to this match. He's calling The Undertaker a coward and a big pussy and an old piece of shit and a little whiny bitch. He's calling him everything he can think of because he's drowning in his own desperation not to accept his mortality. John Cena is the heel in this feud. And that's not even saying that the way smarks always want to say, oh yeah, John Cena's the good guy, but he's always a jerk and he cheats, so really he's the heel. No, John Cena is literally playing the heel in this feud, blatantly. Anyone who says that John Cena would never turn heel or will never turn heel and that it'll never happen, it just happened. He was blatantly the heel in this feud. And as we saw, when it came time to finally fight, He acted like a coward and got his ass beat like a heel. He's the heel because he can't accept his own mortality, whereas the Undertaker in this feud is the babyface because he did accept his own mortality gracefully. So I just love that story that they told. I love the whole idea behind the narrative and the way they executed it of these two unbeatable badass legends who are both nearing the end of their time on top and each have to confront their own mortality and one of them accepts it, one of them can't accept it. One of them reacts to this gracefully, one of them does not react gracefully at all. I remember John Cena cut a promo in a commercial for one of the WWE video games a couple years ago where he recited that poem, Rage Against the Dying of the Light. That's Cena's character in this storyline. 
he is raging against the dying of the light. He's thrashing. He's desperate. He doesn't want to go. So he's standing in the ring every week like an overcompensating chihuahua picking a fight with the biggest dog he can think of, the Undertaker. And the Undertaker is just hanging at home with his wife, eating breakfast and lifting weights. Probably watching TV like, leave me alone. What does this guy want with me? I'm done. So Cena keeps calling out the Undertaker and the Undertaker just flat out does not respond. No response from the Undertaker. No match is made official. Cena tries and tries and tries to egg him on and bait him into accepting this challenge. But he won't. So it comes down to the wire and Cena realizes, I don't have a WrestleMania match. Fuck. I'm a 41-year-old faggot and I fucking, I blew it. I guess I have no choice now but to go to WrestleMania and support the company I love as a fan. So that's what happens. You get to WrestleMania, and Cena is now just hanging out with the crowd. He's sitting in the audience in, like, the front row as a regular fan. And for the first couple of matches in the show, they keep cutting to Cena, like, reacting to the matches. Like, oh my god, I'm a fan watching the show. Holy shit. Look what these guys are doing. Eventually, a referee comes out and whispers into his ear after the first couple of matches some shit about something happening backstage. Cena takes off running backstage, thinking maybe The Undertaker's here, thinking maybe he'll get a match. So now later on in the show, Cena comes out, dressed to wrestle, hoping he has a match. If not with The Undertaker, at least with somebody, out comes Elias. And Elias is this heat magnet dude who walks around with a acoustic guitar and sings like folk songs about how everybody sucks dick except him and he gets booze and everybody hates him but also kind of loves him so Elias comes to the ring and starts singing a song about how John Cena sucks dick and John Cena is just standing there just pissed off that he doesn't get to fight the Undertaker pissed off that he has to fight Elias of all fucking people who's this chump Elias with a fucking guitar challenging me. Are you serious? I should have been fighting The Undertaker, and now I gotta fight this hipster doofus. So Cena comes in the ring. They have a match. Not even a match. Cena just kicks the crap out of him. Really quick. Really easy. He does the five-knuckle shuffle. He puts him in the AA, and he puts him away. And so Cena is left in the ring, having just killed Elias, and his music starts playing like he won something. But he doesn't feel like he won something. He feels like a loser. He feels like a failure. He feels like an old 41-year-old man who doesn't have a real match at WrestleMania. And doesn't have a real opponent. So he walks back up the ramp all sad and miserable and pissed off and mopey. Like a whiny little fucking baby who didn't get what he wanted at the fucking toy store. And then the lights go out. And then the Undertaker's bell tolls. Dong! Who's that bell tolling for? Dong! It tolls for thee, John Cena. The Undertaker's dong is coming for you. So the Undertaker's music plays, and here he comes. Here comes the Undertaker. He's back. The crowd goes ape shit. He does his three hour walk to the ring with the spooky music. That beautiful Undertaker theme that we all love so much. He comes to the ring and the match starts. And John Cena, like the heel that he is in this feud, now has to put his money where his mouth is. He's been talking a lot of shit. But now he's face to face with the returning Undertaker. And the Undertaker is pissed off. And John Cena, for perhaps the first time in his career, is Pissing and pooping in his jorts. They fight. The Undertaker immediately kicks John Cena's ass like it's nothing. John Cena looks visibly terrified throughout all of this. He finally gets one move of offense in. He does all of his moves. He gives him the big boot. He gives him the big leg drop. He gives him the old school walk on the ropes. And John Cena looks visibly terrified throughout all of this. He finally gets in one move of offense, gets The Undertaker on the mat, goes for the five-knuckle shuffle. The Undertaker does his famous sit-up spot, 
as John Cena is rebounding off the ropes. John Cena sees it, literally shits himself in the pants, falls on his ass in the pile of poopy. So John Cena starts pooping and pissing his pants again like a cowardly fuckboy heel, and The Undertaker just beats the shit out of him, kicks his ass all over the ring, Real quick, real easy, like John Cena was nothing. Puts him in the tombstone, one, two, three, Undertaker wins, John Cena's fucking dead. And if not dead, at least greatly humbled. This match was perfect. It was everything it needed to be. It was the perfect conclusion to this very cool and nuanced story between The Undertaker and John Cena. And there's even an extra layer of depth to it because when John Cena was first starting out and first beginning to become big when he was young 15 years ago, one of the first things he did that made him famous was healing it up and talking shit to The Undertaker and challenging The Undertaker and having a bunch of matches and beating up The Undertaker back then. So now you're 15 years later and John Cena is so desperate to hold on to his youth that he's reverting to the same heelish fuckboy tactics that got him over in the first place, calling out The Undertaker with all these schoolyard insults. Only this time he gets his ass kicked for it because he's acting in a manner unbecoming of the legend that he has now become. So The Undertaker, another legend who was graceful enough to accept his old age in retirement, comes back to say, John Cena, suck my dick, Fuck you, go to hell, and (laughs) just beat the crap out of him. This was fucking brilliant. I loved this match. It was a masterpiece. And you know what? I was going to give it four stars. But just now, in telling the story of it and talking about it, I convinced myself to up that score to five stars out of five, baby! Word life! This is basic thugonomics! I'm untouchable, but I'm forcing you to feel me! You never catch me in the next man's sweater! Dead man walking! Are you scared? You've done it now! You've gone and made a big mistake! I can't allow you to think you can just walk away! So turn around! Face the piper, you're gonna pay! The end is now! This is gonna be a judgment day! You're gonna pay, you're gonna pay, there's no forgiveness this time. You're gonna pay, you're gonna pay, it's my business. (coughs) 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 (sighs) Five stars. Oh my god. Okay. What else is in this fucking show? Jesus Christ, there's still like nine more matches to talk about. Okay, next up was Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. So this match is kind of a big deal because it's Daniel Bryan's big return. Daniel Bryan is the most over guy in the company by a thousand fucking miles. He's the man. He's the only person who everyone unanimously loves and uh three years ago he got injured and he had to retire he it was that injury it was the big injury the the one that guys get and they have to not wrestle anymore and he couldn't get cleared by wwe and he was not happy about it he kept threatening that he would just leave once his contract was up and go wrestle somewhere else like new japan or Ring of Honor or fucking PWG, I don't even know what the fuck he was thinking, but he was determined to get back in the ring, and it's just WWE's medical team, because they're such a big publicly traded company who can't afford to fuck up, they are very paranoid and extra hard on the talent. They will not clear you, whereas other companies probably would have cleared him to wrestle. 
But the WWE is very, very cautious and paranoid about that kind of thing. They don't want anybody dying on their watch or getting paralyzed on their time. So Daniel Bryan was retired for three years, and he was not happy about it. And during that time, he became the general manager of SmackDown Live alongside Shane McMahon. And he ended up getting into this petty feud with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, who are, who are a couple of fucking jerks. A couple of jerks who he has known for a long time and was probably friends with back on the indies, which added an extra dimension to the storyline because even though Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens are douchebags, they do sort of have a point in that Daniel Bryan is now the authority who is, in their minds, holding back the talent. Daniel Bryan's whole thing that got him to the levels of fame and adulation that he got to was that he was a a common man, sort of an indie wrestling darling, going up against the authority in the form of Triple H and Stephanie McMahon, going up against the company, the corporate entity that did not want a guy like him to succeed. That was his whole thing that made him a huge deal. And now the roles are sort of reversed, where because of... These unforeseen circumstances of him getting injured and having to retire and now becoming the general manager, now you've got these two guys who knew Daniel Bryan on the indies. I'm sure they've wrestled thousands of times. I'm sure they've been good friends in the past, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, two other indie wrestling darlings, but who are now kind of douchebag smarmy heels who are accusing Daniel Bryan of selling out and becoming the authority that's holding them back. And even though Daniel Bryan knows that they're a couple of assholes, he also kind of feels like they're right, and he hates himself for it, and he hates that he can't wrestle anymore. And so that's been the storyline between these two guys. And also, Kevin Owens has a feud with Shane McMahon. He hates Shane McMahon. He's He beat the shit out of him. They both beat the shit out of Shane McMahon. They hurt him really bad. So they don't like each other. All of a sudden, turns out, Daniel Bryan, finally, after three years of of wanting it and chasing it and training for it and trying to get better, three years of this, finally, Daniel Bryan gets cleared to compete. He can come back now. He can wrestle again. It's a miracle. Everybody's happy. It's the best thing, the best news anyone's ever heard. Everyone's happy for him. It's a, just a feel-good thing. But Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are still over here being a couple of assholes, so... So he's fighting them. So that's the match now. It's Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. And this match is a huge deal, not really for the match itself, but more just for the fact that it's Daniel Bryan's return match. That being said, this match sucked. It was a complete letdown. It blew chunks, and I hated it, and it was gay. And it was fucking lame. Here's what happens. Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon come out. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, I think, are already in the ring. Before the match even starts, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn jump Daniel Bryan and powerbomb him on the apron and kill him. That's it. He's dead. He doesn't even get to start the match. He's just dead. And for, like, the first ten minutes of the match... Shane McMahon is in the ring fighting them by himself, and Daniel Bryan is just laying on the outside of the ring dead. This was not what anybody wanted to see. This was not good. Everybody was so hyped to see Daniel Bryan come back and do his thing and kick people and do his backflips and his kicks and his yes lock and his flying knee. Everyone wanted to see all the Daniel Bryan shit, Everyone wanted to get fired up and pumped up and and rally behind Daniel Bryan. And I guess they thought they could build more suspense by taking him out of the match early on and killing him so that he could come into the match later and save the day. But the problem with that is nobody wants to wait 10 more minutes while Daniel Bryan is dead on the outside of the ring. We've already waited three fucking years. So the match was immediately disappointing and immediately takes the wind out of your sails. You're si- you're think you're sitting there thinking Daniel Bryan's going to come out and wrestle in a match. Oh boy, I'm so excited. I'm so pumped for this and he just immediately gets killed. And then you're sitting there like well, okay. I guess maybe he'll get up and get back in the match 
later, like 10 minutes from now, after Shane McMahon has stood in the ring and done his goofy dance for God knows how long and gotten his ass kicked for however many interminable minutes. So after all that time goes by, eventually Daniel Bryan does get up and get back in the ring, and he does get his moment to come back and kick ass and beat the guys up and win the match. And it was satisfying, but it wasn't as satisfying as it could have been or should have been because they goofed and had him be dead for the first half of the match. Nobody wanted to fucking see that. This was not the match to do that in. This was his return match. If ever there was a time to just do the predictable thing and have Daniel Bryan run in there and immediately start the match killing the guys, this was the time. So what should have been a really big hurrah, Daniel Bryan is back moment, ended up just kind of being a fucking lame, mediocre, disappointing match. They robbed it of what made it special. They robbed it of the thing that would have been amazing. It was fucking stupid. It was disappointing. It sucked dick. It blew ass. And I did not care for it. I'm gonna give this match two stars. What a fucking shame. What a letdown. This should have been a five-star match, but they blew it.